a senior scientist at the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, inventor of the world's first commercially approved COVID-19 paper strip test, revolutionizing the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and working on a cure for sickle cell anemia, Dr. Debujyoti Chakraborty is nothing short of a genius among us. Please welcome him for the talk about gene editing and its real world applications. So when I was young, like many of my friends in school, I wanted to be a doctor. The aspiration was that that's one of the ways by which you can make a tangible change to a positive health in some, some individual. Now unfortunately, my grades were not very good and neither could I make it through any medical college. So I settled for the next best alternative which was to study molecular biology and human genetics. And in 2015, through a chance encounter with Professor Jennifer Doudna, who actually discovered the CRISPR system and gene editing, and later on went to win the Nobel Prize in chemistry, the trajectory of my life kind of changed. I came back to India, started a lab, and started working on something by which I could actually connect to patients in a much bigger way without actually having a bona fide medical degree. Today I'm going to share my story with you. So you see, the human DNA is really long. It has more than 3.9 billion alphabet and this is mostly coming from A, T, G and C. These are the alphabets in the human genome. And human genetic diseases happen when there are some mistakes in this DNA. And these mistakes could sometimes be passed from the parents to the child, or sometimes you could sim simply have them during one's own lifetime due to lifestyle choices we make, or our exposure to the environment, and so on. When such mistakes happen, as we call them as mutations in the DNA, the result could be quite catastrophic sometimes. Deadly diseases can happen. And, you know, that is the outcome of such changes. But that brings us to the existential question. If you do have such changes that make you predisposed to diseases in your lifetime, is it actually possible to revert it and make one normal once again? As we often joke in the CRISPR field, there is something called a before CRISPR era or a BC, where it would have been thought that this is all a kind of a science fiction novel. But thanks to very precise genome editing tools like CRISPR, the answer to this question is actually a resounding yes. And you would believe it that there are people like you and me, who is walking about on this planet, who have had their genomes altered and are potentially living disease-free lives at this point of time. Now, the human genome can very much be compared to a word processor file. You write up a big letter or you know a document, and sometimes you make mistakes in this document. One way to correct these mistakes is you take the cursor to the point where the mistake has happened, and you press the delete button, you enter a nucleotide, and you save after inserting the right letter. The human genome, as I said, is composed of four letters, A, T, G, and C. And in order to correct a mutation or a specific mistake in that human genome, somewhere in the 3.9 billion letters, you would have to divide, you, to, you need to have a device which will actually do all this work together. The CRISPR-Cas9 system does that. It is in one hand something which can break the DNA, delete a letter, insert something, and then uses the cell's own DNA repair machinery to make a very precise change. And this precise change can essentially be used to correct genetic mutations. You might be wondering where such a cool technique actually came to be from in, in nature. And as it turns out, with most of the big discoveries in science and biology, the origins of CRISPR are actually very humble. 
they come from some of the simplest organisms and there you call them simple again because bacteria is where CRISPR originate. Post pandemic, several of you are aware of what is known as an immunological memory. We have a memory of our previous infections when a virus attacks us or when we have exposure to vaccines. Similarly, in bacteria too, when a virus, which is called a bacteriophage, attacks the bacteria, the bacteria keeps some of the information of the genetic material of that virus in its own genome so that next time the same virus attacks it, it can quickly assemble these complexes of proteins out of which the Cas protein is an, is an important part to shred the DNA into pieces. And this happens very quickly. Like you see over here, the single thread that you're seeing is actually a DNA. And on top of it, there is a protein, which is the Cas protein sitting. And in no time, it can chop that DNA. Now that's quite remarkable because that tells you that scientists can very smartly take this component out of a bacterial cell and use it for manipulating DNA, even of humans. And this whole concept of being able to manipulate the human genome, or for that matter, any genome, is quite extraordinary. Because it gives rise to opportunities which nobody could think about earlier. People have been able to actually manipulate the genome of plant cells, for example, by which they make disease-resistant crops, higher yield, better varieties of crops, they can also do things where changing entities in the biomanufacturing system of certain types of uh, biosimilars or synthetic biology products, you can increase the yield and make it better. They can use it for cool applications, like writing information into DNA, such as a song or a movie using CRISPR, because it essentially can code for information. But perhaps the most important aspect of using genome editing which has touched most number of lives is its impact on human health. And I come back to that original dream that I had of being able to make a tangible out, you know, a tangible contribution to human health in some way. At CSR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, me and my colleague, Dr. Shobhik Maiti, we have been developing precise genome editors and trying to cure diseases such as sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a blood disease where your normally circular red blood cells, because of a single mistake in the DNA which converts the letter A to T, can give rise to a condition which is extremely painful, requires blood transfusions throughout life, and oftentimes death. Unfortunately, this disease happens mostly in the tribal populations of India with very little access to healthcare. Through our efforts, we have been able to develop genome editors which can, in a very precise manner and in a very robust manner, actually convert this faulty T back to A and hopefully cure the disease. With a lot of support from stakeholders, including the funding agencies, Government of India, and others, and most importantly, the patient groups, we are com completing preclinical studies at this point to take this to actual humans in the next couple of years. But it's not just sickle cell anemia. I have told you about a technology which can change DNA. So what we also do is use this for a variety of other diseases as well ranging from diseases of the eye, which causes blindness, genetic mutations, or diseases which cause degradation of the neurons, neuropathies, or in some cases, such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a very debilitating disorder, which makes children, boys, wheelchair bound at a very young age, and then leads to a slow and agonizing death. Perhaps the most important aspect of all this work that I'm talking today about is that it is a very humbling experience to connect to the various stakeholders, whether they are clinicians, whether they are patients themselves, or their family members, and really ponder about how science can go beyond labs and contribute to the society. In all this work, I have a very strong team which supports me, 
which is made up of extremely energetic, very innovative, and very focused young researchers. And they have come up with techniques by which you not only use CRISPR to, as a therapeutics, but also some other innovative applications. One of them is for CRISPR diagnostics, where we use the molecular biology behind DNA-protein interaction, which is CRISPR binding to DNA, and marry that with paper strip chemistry, like a pregnancy strip, and then be able to actually identify mutations in a piece of DNA. That led to FELUDA, or FNCAS9 Editor-Linked Uniform Detection Assay, one of the first paper strip approved tests for CRISPR in the world. And we have also developed similar things for point of care diagnosis of diseases such as sickle cell anemia, where children can be asked to spit into a small test tube, and this DNA is then you know, analyzed for mutations. If you're wondering where this name came from, as you might know, Feluda is the name of a detective from the stories of Satyajit Ray, uh, who is an Oscar-winning filmmaker and writer. There's another innovation that I want to talk today about, is where students in the lab have actually managed to combine CRISPR biology with stem cell biology and make personalized mini brains, as we call it, or mini organs resembling the brain on a dish where you could, in principle, study things which would be otherwise very, very difficult. Such as, for example, how do neurons move or how uh, neurons migrate? And this marries, again, two different technologies, the stem cell biology and the purpose of genome editing, where you can manipulate the, you know, genes, and then study complex diseases which would be otherwise very difficult to study, such as autism or bipolar disorder, and so on. I hope that I have been able to convince you that this is a remarkable technology, an extremely powerful technology too. But as one of our superhero movies have often said, that you know, with great power, there also comes great responsibility. And this is something very, very important in the CRISPR field as well. In fact, as some of you must have seen the movie Jurassic Park, and what happens when you have unrestricted and uncontrolled use of genome manipulation techniques, you end up creating monsters that threaten humanity. But we, don't have, we haven't yet created monsters yet using CRISPR. But what has definitely happened is that there has been a lot of controversy regarding the use of CRISPR in different forms. One of them, came from the editing of human embryos, which started in China. And then the moratorium, or the uh, complete ban on human embryonic editing. These are some of the applications that we need to talk about. But I'll leave you with perhaps the most important aspect of CRISPR that we need to talk about. And that is, who owns CRISPR? And how do we make it accessible and affordable to all? At this point of time, a CRISPR therapy is extremely expensive. And part of these expenses are because of the IP rights, the production, the big pharma companies who are involved, and so on. So it is high time that people like me and you, we start discussing and deliberating these issues. Because if a genome editing technology is applicable only to a chosen few who can pay for it, then there is this risk that this world will be developed, you know, divided into haves and have-nots. People who have access to making their genes better, to correcting their diseases, and then there are the people who actually need them but cannot access them. Mind you, the country with the highest number of sickle cell patients in the world is actually Africa. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is perhaps the most important question to ponder about today. And it's a science which is more complicated than the science of CRISPR itself. Thank you.